Greetings. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. I am Steve Dace, and I am here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Last night, I got a chance to speak to a room full of activists, elected officials, congressional candidates, patriots. Um, and clearly, that was a much when I got back to my room uh, and saw the reaction to last night's festivities. Clearly, that was a, a much better use of my time than Weekend at Bernie's meets Reds versus uh, Waiting for Guffman meets Stepford Wives. Whatever that was last night. I mean, whatever that was. I, I mean, I... I, I that's I, America, Steve. That's what that is. That, that's... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And thankfully, there's another America. And I was in a room with them last night. But my goodness. I mean, I don't... I don't even know what to say. I... All the Republicans had to do, just put a lucid, likable person. It didn't even matter what they said. It didn't even matter what they said. Just put a lucid, likable person on the set next to Joe Biden. And they they couldn't even manage that. That is performative. I mean, listen, I've seen people make far more uh, worse and impactfully heinous policies. But in terms of performative politics, I think that is the worst moment ever caught on camera in the world. (laughs) <laughs> ever ever i'm not and i'm not i i saw people's comments i'm like okay yeah I, I mean we've had you know rubio water sips bobby jindal what is that okay fine cool you know can't be that bad i went back after watching a clip i said okay i gotta watch this i watched the whole thing and i t- I, I i i still can't believe it's real i still cannot believe that they put that on screen last night i just don't even know what to say Anyway, you heard Todd Erzin's voice. He's back there in Des Moines, as is Aaron McIntyre. We have a special guest coming up for the Dace Group. You you have requested this. You'll find out that your request, we take your request, your long-distance dedications here on American Top 40. Uh, And uh, this one uh, has been uh, has been received and uh, your wish is our command. So you'll meet our fourth panelist here in a matter of moments after I tell you about our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company, the Patriot owned Christian coffee company that doesn't just share your values, but uh, they also and more importantly, frankly, we can have great values and suck at making coffee. So, you know, stick with the values. Don't stick with coffee making. Do something else. These guys make tremendous coffee. Just ask Aaron. There's a flavor for every freedom-loving American. It is shipped within days of being roasted, and the roast date is put there right on each bag. So go to firstcup.com. Use the code DACE to get 10% off at firstcup.com. Promo code DACE. And if you subscribe, you get an additional 10% off for the life of your subscription. Take advantage of all of that at firstcup.com. Promo code DACE. Next hour, we will get to the DACE. We'll get to, I'm sorry, Feedback Friday. But this hour, it is time for the Dace Group. Your weekly look at the week that was and look what the cat or shall we say the donkey dragged in. He is wow. back. Like Archie Bunker had his one black friend. This is our one Democrat friend. It's the one and only Paul Alexander. Good to see you, brother. How are you? You know, Steve, if the entirety of your montage today is not highlights of Katie Britt's national audition for Law and Order SVU from last night, I am going to be furious. Here's the thing maybe our audience doesn't know, and it, it shouldn't be a surprise or th- since you, if, if you stop and think about it, since you are our one Democrat friend, but your background is actually in Hollywood content development, you know, uh, content yeah. production. So you are uniquely qualified. I mean, I thought that last night that was if Chud, if Chud impregnated a Stepford wife, that is what that was last night. I, 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 I still I still can't believe that that our, our that our side ran out with that last night. I, I I'm t- I talked to a, a sort of a, a little birdie of mine, who got a text message from, uh, uh, from one of her top consultants before the event, and said, all right, here's your talking points, you know, you know, to go out and help, you know, and, and really pump her up. And after he saw what transpired last night, he just went dark, went silent. He's like, I can't, I can't, I just, I, I can't promote that. 
Am I, Paul, seriously, just put the politics aside. From a presentation standpoint, you're a pro. And so I guess I, hey, I'm a producer of movies. I made one movie. All right. So, yeah. um, so but you're the pro here. Am I, from a presentation standpoint, am I overselling this, how bad it was? No. Uh, I thought there was a lot of potential when she first came on screen. I thought the setting was a smart choice. Um, I thought just in terms of her physical appearance, she was a good choice to connect with those suburban moms. But once we got into the, the meat of the performance, it was just so over the top that any, any inkling of authenticity was out the window and it just became a Saturday Night Live sketch. So you are, you are not uh, over, overstating the disaster of what happened on the GOP side last night. And, and politically, here's why it matters. Because when you're running against incum an incumbent, you don't want to do anything that takes the pressure off of him and puts it on you. You want all the attention on him. You want it to be a referendum on him. Okay? And almost no one is talking about Biden's speech last night um, in normie America other, uh, because of whatever that was that the Republicans well, put on the screen. I also think Joe Biden benefited from the GOP continually setting lower and lower expectations. I thought he had a fairly good night considering the standard that they've set for him. Uh, he was energetic. He didn't have many fumbles. He Which is don't cry for pudding. That's basically the standard they've set for him. I mean, seriously, that's basically the standard, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think people are comparing him to Barack Obama or Bill Clinton. They they know the bar is lower, and based on that lower bar, I thought he exceeded most people's expectations. Gentlemen, before we get to the rest of the, am I? Are we stepping on what you have in store for us, Aaron? Because if you are, we'll go right to it. Nope. No, okay, all right. I, so, you guys have any comments on what transpired last night before we get to regular order here with the day group? Other than just being objectively evil from a presentation standpoint. I am. I kind of agree with Paul. I, I mean, couldn't have asked for really much more from uh, from that package in Joe Biden. So yeah, I thought the speech was evil, but he didn't he didn't vomit all over. Well, he didn't vomit uh, as much over himself as we're used to seeing uh, sometimes. So I thought it was you know he didn't he didn't fall over. He didn't collapse. So I think that's a win. <laughs> <laughs> In the, heat, in the middle of it, he didn't scream, how can you have your pudding if you don't eat your meat? All right, Todd, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, the guy cares more about a half-empty bag of potato chips than he does about Lack and Riley, but, you know, if if the Republicans can't message against that with with something better, well, I, I, I come back to, again, what Paul said. That, that there's, there's nothing that happened last night, uh, ultimately that we don't know about Biden, we don't know about the Democrats, we, we this this heinousness that is, uh, sadly, it's baked into the cake. So it would take some kind of theatrical collapse because it's all show, and Biden didn't, and the Republicans did. That's it. I was at... Uh I was at breakfast. At, I went to get some eggs at my hotel for breakfast this morning, and they had the local newscaster in Minneapolis on. Now, of course, it's a very blue city, but it was it was fascinating. The lead up from the local uh, anchorette was a fiery, passionate Joe Biden came out swinging against Republicans in last night's State of the Union, which was much more like a campaign speech than a broad policy agenda speech by a president. Here's a clip, and they go to this clip. So you know that they you know that they curated this clip for, for the setup, at least you would assume. I mean, this is a top television market in the country. And in the clip, he stutters like three times and then finally gets out what he wanted to say. So I just, whatever. It is what it is. Let's get to issue one. Bleep Lord Nefarious says... I'm not that worried about AI. I just, I just doesn't get my blood going to get worried about AI. I think of some positive aspects of it. I mean, I've seen how humans have handled history and not great. Mm. And, and so I'm ready for the, you know, big machines that make big decisions programmed by fellows with compassion and vision. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm ready for the machines to tell us what to do. We, in, we expect and anticipate there's gonna be an updated COVID vaccine coming this fall. Right, so plan now, yeah. right? it's March, so you can think ahead when you're gonna get your flu shot in the fall, you're gonna get another updated COVID vaccine. All too often, 
I hear leaders talk about providing everyone with dignity and respect like it's an aspirational goal. That's not good enough. Dignity and respect is the bare minimum. Happy National Reading Day. Today, we are reading, introducing Teddy. A gentle story about gender and friendship. Will always be your friend, Thomas. Thomas the Teddy took a deep breath. <sighs> I need to be myself, Errol. In my heart, I've always known that I'm a girl Teddy, not a boy Teddy. We have inclusion across all groups in the military. Come back tomorrow morning for the first 10 minutes and then, then run away. I'm gonna focus a little bit more today on my story and that of transgender service members and how and why that fits into the picture of why inclusion matters. I mean, if you look at some of these exit polls, I mean, I live in Virginia. Immigration was the number one <laughs> issue. Yeah. I mean, again, these could change in, in Virginia. Well, Virginia does have a border with West Virginia. <laughs> very, very contested area. Build the wall. Like My larger reaction is disappointment. I do believe that states should be able under our constitution to bar oath-breaking insurrectionists. There was really no way for us to consistently as a team, the six of us in those six battlegrounds states, which Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia, to constantly both compare notes and also say, okay, how are we going to respond to this nationally coordinated effort with a coordinated um, uh, response? Uh, and so that's, now we have that. And we're all talking, we're all working together. And we're all very clear about what we're up against. In fact, some of the small snack companies, you won't uh, and think you won't even notice what they're doing. Uh, when they charge you just as much for the same size bag of potato chips, only has a hell of a lot fewer chips in it. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you who did notice, the cookie monster. <laughs> he pointed out cookies are, his cookies are getting smaller. Hey, uh, okay, first question. Well, I, I wasn't sure where to go after that. Uh, Paul, as the guest, you go first. Uh, the most disgusting and revolting thing you just witnessed was what? Well, you said at the top of the hour that uh, I was backed by popular demand. I think this might be the last time that happens. But, uh, you know, I, I actually want to make a more macro commentary on these montages. So I I've got a really bold take for you this week, Steve. I genuinely believe Joe Biden getting reelected will actually be better for the long term health of the conservative movement than if Trump wins this November. And I, I did say the conservative movement and not MAGA because I, I do believe they are different. But I have been thinking about what issues are most often featured in these montages and whether it's introducing children to transgenderism and critical race theory or the fallout from COVID and the lack of accountability for big pharma or the declining influence and credibility of the church in America. All of these things either took their initial foothold or dramatically accelerated because Trump has provided the most effective smokescreen imaginable for the excesses of the far left. And to me, it's laughable when I hear his supporters claiming he's exposing all of this and Americans are finally waking up because in reality, he created the diversion that allowed this to flourish in the first place. And I know his supporters like to be dismissive and reduce his detractors to people just complaining about mean tweets. But if you step back and honestly assess the situation, his complete lack of impulse control, messaging discipline, and any actual knowledge of how the mechanics of government work, he was the best thing that could ever happen for the far left. Aside from the Paul Ryan tax reform, nearly everything he accomplished domestically that was seen as a conservative victory was done through executive action, and it was immediately overturned as soon as Biden took office. He was constantly distracted and consumed with petty grievances, lashing out, settling scores, creating controversies, and because of this, his crude and vulgar style for the apolitical, the suburban moderates, the politically disengaged, anything seen as opposition to him was immediately given some benefit of the doubt, or even seen as being righteous. When, when he attempted to act on culture war issues, the transgender military ban or the Muslim ban, both with, for the record, I disagreed with, but when he attempted to do these things, he was so grossly underprepared and ill-advised to actually execute on them that they immediately fell apart. And because this isn't a Ron DeSantis who is well-studied and thoughtful in how he carries out a plan, it's just impulsive, half-baked, haphazard nonsense that 
goes nowhere and creates sympathy for his opposition. And there is such a culture of cowardice among the rank and file GOP who are just terrified of him and desperate for his endorsement that basic principles of conservatism don't even matter anymore. Spending, the debt, uh, entitlement reform, Trump wants to ignore them, so we'll ignore them. He wants to throw pro-lifers under the bus and blame them for the midterm losses of stellar candidates like Mehmet Oz and Herschel Walker. I guess that's fine too. His movement will never be called to, to galvanize and hold Big Pharma accountable because Trump says, Operation Warp Speed was one of his greatest accomplishments. And we cannot threaten Trump's fragile ego, Steve. And, and why would the church, which many rightly or wrongly see as a conservative institution, remain credible in terms of its moral leadership when the conservative cultural movement is led by a man who is a known pathological liar, who cheats on his wife with porn stars and claims he has never asked God for forgiveness? How can conservatism thrive under those conditions, Steve? So I really do think the longer Trump remains the leader of this movement, the easier it will remain for you, what you call the cultural rot, to continue on a post. And I do think Biden winning re-election will force conservatives to finally turn the page on Trump and hopefully rediscover some actual principles rather than just this unwavering allegiance to a man who believes in nothing other than himself. That's actually not much different than what Shannon Joyce said in your exact same spot last week. And wow. I mean, it, there's a different spin on it because you had some different ideological beliefs. But if, if people were to pull up Daniel Horowitz's podcast on a daily basis for the last year and a half, that wouldn't wouldn't sound much different than what, what you just said. And I think that you speak for why we have a, a, a voter base turnout problem outside of Trump's most rabid supporters. Um, and it showed itself in all of the off year elections. Now, there's a there's another side of the picture. I mean, there were good things accomplished. You cannot argue that economically we were not better off from 2017 to 2019 than we are now. Um, you cannot argue from a foreign policy standpoint, we were doing Abrahamic Accords. Now Israel is fighting the first domestic soil war on a, uh, in 50 years that threatens to any day now uh, spill over into a wider conflict. So, you know, there's, there's, there are clearly things that, that his administration were objectively better at prior to COVID than this administration has even tried to be. But that also speaks to the overall confusion of this debate and why it is such a divisive topic. And it's why many people on my side don't want to touch it. I mean, I'm probably going to sell about 10,000 fewer children's books because I will let people like you say things like this on my show. Most people don't want, don't want to take a hit like that. And so they won't let you or Shannon Joy or Daniel Horowitz on their shows to say things like that. But I, I didn't get into this business to sell 10,000 books. I, I got I got into this business, Paul, if I'm going to be if we're, can we be blunt? We're going to be real blunt now out in the open. Yeah. OK, I got into this business, brother, because of people like you. I got into the, I got into this business because I, 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 I want to reach with the most important message of the universe, people like you. And the most immediate conduit that gives me a chance to reach people like you is political, cultural commentary. And that if I can demonstrate a certain level of cohesive worldview and integrity at a pressure point that you're engaged in, maybe I can get you to look at the claims of Jesus or what the Bible has to say in ways maybe you weren't willing to look at it before. And that's my prime directive. It's why I don't cut corners some other people do. It's why I don't make as much money as other people do. It's why I let people say things and engage in a conversation, in a debate, like I just did with your filibuster, or Shannon last week, or Daniel every week on my show for the last how many years, and others. It's, it's, it's because that this is missional to me more than it is monetary. And the reality is what you articulated to some degree, we could disagree about how far you went with it or the degree uh, fundamentally explains why he makes it really hard for people to like and admire him as a president, why he makes it really hard for people to vote for him when the contrast is so obviously worse objectively when you just look at a policy outcome. So I, I don't have, I'm not going to argue fundamentally with many of the things you have said. You, you, if anything, you took a lot of the laments we've expressed on this show over the last seven or eight years at various and different times, along with things that we've been, uh, we have credited and we've been positive about at the same time. But you took a, you know, um, with your own spin from your own belief system, but you just fundamentally took a lot of the complaints and grievances we've aired over the last eight years and went on one hell of a rant. So, I, you know, I don't agree with all of it to, to the degrees of it, but 
it's your opinion. If I didn't want your opinion, brother, I wouldn't have invited you on the show. Todd, Aaron, what do you think, either about what Paul said or Aaron's montage? I'll combine a couple things, both that uh, MSNBC panel and then the, I believe, Aaron, is it the Michigan Secretary of State? Yeah, Jocelyn Benson. She may as well be on that panel. I, she's clapping like a seal uh, wa- watching that. They're all, they're all the same people. They are evil. They are malicious. They are deceitful. And I'm, I'm mentioning this in, particularly in the context of what Steve mentioned about Katie Britt. But, but sadly, because of what we do over and over again when opportunities are there for people like Britt to perform, somehow, some way, we, we see the Michigan Secretary of State coming. Well, she, she sounds like a normal person. I mean, she's lying through her teeth. She's absolutely ready, willing, and able to manipulate election uh, uh, on behalf of what she believes in, just as those so-called journalists are. But they are smiling. They look like they're having fun. They're comfortable. And the spotlight comes on us, and we just uh, crap the bed. So it, in, it, uh, it, it, in light of where we started this show, I think that needs to be the worst of the week. Aaron? So going off of what Paul said, I had no idea he was going to go off on that rant. I just want people to remember, because we need to move on. I, I want people to remember what he just did, the mental math that he just laid out. And it's exactly why my prediction is what it's going to be this week. So I want people to bookmark that in their minds when I make my prediction, because Paul just made my job a lot easier. Let's get to the exit question on a scale of one to 10, with one being the likelihood Republicans on Capitol Hill will fight Democrats on anything this year, and 10 being the chances they'll fight us instead on all kinds of things. Uh, Rank this week's level of total depravity. Todd? 10. Paul? I'm just so proud there's no more Lindsey Graham jokes. You get a 10 for that. (laughs) Nice. Aaron? 10. All right, let's get to issue two, and I am very glad we have Paul here for this topic. No, you're not being replaced, so stop saying such things. Last weekend on 60 Minutes, former Border Patrol chief during the first two years of the Biden administration, Raul Ortiz, says he's never had a singular conversation with Kamala Harris or Joe Biden. I've never had one conversation with the president or the vice president, for that matter. And so I was the chief of the Border Patrol. I commanded 21,000 people. That's a problem. Now this week, California state lawmakers have introduced a bill that would create a program for illegal aliens to put zero down on a no payment quote unquote loan for a house. Not sure what transgendered math they're using. Conservative estimates are that around 7.2 million illegals have entered the country since Joe Biden took office. All right, Paul, I am I am very sincerely eager to get an alternative viewpoint to answer this question. OK, um, if this isn't a replacement, then it can. What is the alternative explanation for what is being allowed to occur at the border? Well, I I struggle to understand the replacement argument. Maybe you can enlighten me. But but considering those here illegally can't vote in state or federal elections, there's no voting records to suggest they would be reliably democratic voters. So that that's one. But yeah. two, when it when it comes to the affordable housing. If only the federal government can deport these people and you want to prevent homeless encampments from consuming your streets, the state has to make it easier for these people to get housed. Now, I don't think it's right to reward their illegal behavior and offer them more favorable terms than law-abiding citizens on home loans, so I'm definitely not endorsing that idea. But I, I do acknowledge there are limited good options without the federal agencies stepping in. Ending sanctuary city policies would be a step in the right direction to curb the flow moving forward. But for those already there, it's a difficult problem to solve. And I I will say I really do think this is the first election cycle in decades where it will be possible for Democrats to go on the offensive with border security. I know that's crazy to to probably hear, but I, I think you and other conservatives had valid concerns on that bipartisan immigration bill when it came to the D.C. Circuit Court and the daily crossing threshold. But not bringing it to the floor and not allowing it to go through an amendment process and at least giving the optics that you're trying to improve it and just doing nothing because Trump said he wanted to run on the issue. I think Democrats will be able to use that to their advantage this November. Why aren't the federal agencies doing anything? 
That's a fair question. And I think I think Biden's record on the border is abysmal and across party lines. He's underwater on that issue. So there's there's no excuse for the lack of action being taken. I and to answer, to answer your question to- of, of, of how the replacement idea works, um, you cloward piven the system, meaning you let it be overrun to the point that people then have no alternative but to uh, give all these millions we've allowed in. It's not practical to deport them. We have to do something, as you just articulated. Uh, and so we give them a path to citizenship, and then uh, eventually uh, they get a, they get their citizens. They have a right to vote. And voila, you've just completed the greatest voter drive in American history. That's, that's it. There's more to it than that. But for the sake of time, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, I, I I feel it's a bit impractical, but your exit question addresses my answer on the on the other side. So maybe we'll okay. Jump okay, there. Todd, you want to chime in next? I want to ask a question, Paul. Do you believe that Biden uh, actually does need additional legislation in order to uh, do something about the border? Do something? No, of course not. He can do something uh, in terms of a long term solution. I do think it has to go through the legislation. Why? Because laws are passed through the legislator. Yeah, but we already have a we we we. This is like a, any number of other issues. We already have a constitution. We have laws. He can shut down the border anytime. What extra law? This is like gun rights. What extra law? Look, because it's such a polarizing, divisive issue. I think you need to. I don't sell care. To the Enforce the law. Consensus. I I know you don't care, but I'm saying in terms of being well received by the broader public. I think it does have to go what, through the legislature. Well received is not a girl being able to go jogging and not getting her skull crushed. Yes, I, I'm aware of that. And those are I, horribly tragic. Well, then if you're incidents. aware of that, as smart as your first answer was, this one is totally lacking in decency and compassion. And I'm saying that to you as somebody who genuinely likes you as a friend. For God's sakes, enough. I, there's no enough it's inhuman to continue to try to dance through the raindrops on this the raindrops are bleeding out of the sky i will not tolerate answers like this it's simply inhumane i'll let you respond you're, 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 paul go ahead go ahead no look todd you're, you're you're free to express your opinion on that i know it's something you feel strongly about i do too i live in new york city and it's gotten really bad here as far as the migrant crisis is concerned uh, I just think for it to be fixed in the long term, you can't put a Band-Aid on it through executive order. It might It's not an executive of- order. There are laws. It's called a border. It's not that you're playing games. That's nonsense. There's a border. It has a legal definition. We have a guy on there who said it's my job and I have this army who's supposed to be able to stop it, but the president won't talk to me. Stop. You can't believe your own words on this, Paul. You're too damn smart. Paul, yes, but there what would are... be... Go ahead. No, but there are obvious loopholes within the asylum system that are being abused that need reform to fix this for decades to come. Yes, you can take some bold action right now. It's not a loophole. They just don't care that there's a border. It's Hold not on a loophole. Second. We're going to run short on. We're going to We're going to run short on time. Paul, is there any benign innocent explanation for why the head of the border patrol would have never had a conversation with the president or vice president at this point? No, there's complete negligence on the behalf of, of the Biden administration, and this clearly hasn't been a priority for them until this upcoming election cycle. And now they're going to try and spin it and weaponize it, and it may or may not work. We'll see. Let's get to the exit question. Do you really believe this issue has finally reached enough of a breaking point? that the American people would tolerate mass deportations. Todd. Nope. Aaron. Hell no. Paul. I disagree. I think within reason, yes. I think if you limited the deportations to people who've arrived in maybe the last 24 months, anyone with a criminal record, anyone not employed living off the taxpayer, I think you would find the will to tolerate some level of mass deportation if the criteria appeared reasonable. If it's, if it is, as specified as what Paul just said, I actually agree with that. I do think 
I think when we get into traditionally, these questions been you know asked in the context that people have been here a long time, have families and everything else. But if we're we're if we're talking the recency of the uh, the current crisis, and it's as specified as what taught or I'm sorry, what Paul just laid out, I I actually think that that is possible. Here here's why. By the way, can I just say real quick before we get out of here? Here's why I just let people talk and give opinions that don't fit everybody's orthodoxies and uh, and pet causes. Hey, Constitution Wealth is the Patriot's choice in wealth management. Let me ask you something. Are you one of those folks? And uh, there's a growing number of you that are going out of your way not to do business if you can avoid it with people who hate you. Well, if that's you, why not apply that to your investments and your retirement funds? with those exact same businesses. And that's what they want to help you with. At Constitution Wealth, they can help you build a solid investment plan uh, because maybe you'll still get to retire someday. And you want to make sure you get to do so while reducing your investments in ESG, DEI, as well as every other woke corporate initiative out there. So um, put your money, your prosperity, put it to good use in defense of your principles. Work with an advisor who shares your conservative patriotic values. Why work with anyone else? Just go to constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. Sign up for a free consultation today. That's constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. All right, I'm here in Minneapolis. Uh, Todd and Aaron are back there in uh, Des Moines. Our good friend Paul Alexander is here with us, our one Democrat friend. Um, who is here with us on the show for the roundtable. And I, I want to call a quasi-audible before we continue on with, with, the group, or with the topic three. Um, and, I, and forgive me, folks, I'm on remote location. And sometimes we have two people calling in on, uh, on remote location at the same time. Um, it's hard to hear the return audio. I missed the cue, and so we had an awkward ending there. That's on me. Uh, I want to go, go back and, and reset what I was trying to say there at the end. What you just heard on this show, and, and it, you know, I felt this way, you're going to feel maybe a, a strange feeling. Um, and it's similar to what I felt watching Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s response to the State of the Union last night, or really his own State of the Union last night. And I, I mean, it was very weird, peculiar. I didn't necessarily even agree with, you know, everything. You know, he's to the left of me on several issues. But just looking at the presentation, um, the vision, the inspiration, I, I, I was searching for a word. And I'm like, is this what presidential looks like? I had forgotten. It's been so long. Um, and, and so uh, similarly, what you just saw on our show was a debate. I'll pause there for a second. An actual debate. That's what you yeah. – did it get a little heated? Sure. We're guys. We all know each other. We've all broken bread together. Are we, do we have different viewpoints? You bet. In some places, are those viewpoints maybe irreconcilable? May turn out that way. Who knows? But – there's this there's this notion in America today that all we do is argue that we're actually not arguing at all. We're not arguing at all. We're not. We're retreating to silos. Um, and one side says you're not worthy of being debated. You're a racist. You're a homophobe. You're a misogynist. You're lower than zero. We won't grace you with our presence. We won't give you agency. We won't recognize your autonomy. But. Too often, it seems as if our side has just decided the answer to that is just, you know, to get on our own circular self-pleasuring, um, you know, uh, confab and sit around and, con- you know, lift up a butt cheek and convince each other our own farts don't stink. There's reasons we're losing elections. And there's reasons why we're getting our ass kicked. And, you know, there are people out there, we need to change some hearts and minds. There's not some silent majority anymore. It's not 1989. Just waiting for the dog whistle from shows like this, and then they they know what to do on election day. And so we got to get back in the fight. We say we want free speech. We say we want an exchange of ideas. In the first half hour of the show, you heard one. You just don't get a chance to hear it very often. And, you know, Paul gave it to Donald Trump real hard. You know, and Donald Trump's a big boy, wants to be president of the United States, hope he can take it. In return, on another issue, Todd gave it to Paul real hard. Paul's a big boy. Obviously, he can take it. Otherwise, he wouldn't come on the show here today. And that's okay. These are big stakes, big ideas. You know, nothing short of the next generation of the, of the greatest country on earth is at stake here with some of the decisions we're making right now. I think about that. My daughter, Anastasia, is in labor right now. As we speak, we're awaiting word right now on the arrival of our first grandchild. As we speak, she's in labor. 
you don't if you don't think if you don't think when she's done giving birth to Autumn, she has a real vested interest in this conversation as opposed to, you know, what what stupid thing did Biden say in a hot mic to a bunch of Democrats? And what stupid shirt is Marjorie Taylor Greene wearing? And what a masterful troll that is. None of that. None of it. It may get us clicks. It might get us engagement. It might get me a corner, the first seat in the Mar-a-Lago Orchestra, or it or it might it might get me booked on corporate media on the other side. But none of it, none of it, means anything to that grandbaby that's coming out of my daughter's birth canal as we speak, or any of your babies and grandbabies that you have right now or are still to come. What they really need is not our trolls. What they really need is what they heard in the first half hour of this show. Playing for big stakes here. Future literally of the planet. Go big or go home. It's a fight. Sometimes even brothers and friends are going to disagree, throw punches. You ever fight with your brother? We need more of this, not less. And I know it's a little uncomfortable at times to listen to. You know why? Because we're not used to listening to it. This was Tuesday in this country 50 years ago. Any day of the week. This is how things got debated, how things got discussed. We don't do that anymore. Yeah. There was some anger. There's some anger in Paul's voice. And, and if I could, you know, I don't want to psychoanalyze you, Paul, but I think some of your anger is a frustration that people on my side are putting you in a position where you don't feel like there's a bridge you can walk across to get away from the crazy on your own side. Is that a fair assumption on some level? Absolutely. And so that's where the passion comes in on a personal level. You are disappointed that you would, you would, you would like to hear more of what we have to say, but you are personally disappointed in your view. We can't seemingly can't do better than we currently are. Is that fair? Yep. Yeah. Todd, passion in your voice was here's a reasonable guy that clearly gets a lot of nuanced things why do we why can't he get close down the damn border and stop this stuff and you had some passion come out where that came along right fair yeah that i if not paul who the rest of his party isn't i have all kinds of friends i've spent on the soccer soccer sidelines i know they're liberal but who if what's it going to take for everybody to say you know what we've gone off the deep end we got to stop i never hear it ever. here's the thing at the end of that debate and that discussion back and forth for 30 minutes, who was the first guy on this panel to say, yeah, you know what? I think maybe people might be at a breaking point. They might accept mass deportations. Who was the first one that said it? Paul. Paul. How'd we get here? How'd we get here? We had a debate. We asked questions. We let people talk. We treated people like adults. We gave them an audience. We need more of what you just heard, not less. Everybody's seen our memes. Everybody's heard our trolls. Everybody's listened to our rants. Everybody's read our books. By the way, Why Easter is on sale right now at Amazon.com. If you'd like to get your copy, I would highly urge you to do that. I think your kids would really enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I think we need more of what we just heard. More of it. And... I don't know why you thought this would be your last. Uh, I'm kind of I'm, I'm actually more insulted that you thought that might be your last appearance on the show, Paul, <laughs> more than I was at anything you actually said. That's just not how we roll here. I mean, I know. I, I know. Yeah. It, it, and if it you was said something I thought I, was I factually dishonest, I would have stepped in. I, I You had opinions I don't agree with, but I don't think they're necessarily factually dishonest. So. Aaron, you have you have been uh, quiet because of the back and forth. I want to let, let you chime in next on this. So as it pertains to to the border, I, this is kind of in, in my mind. I, again, we're, we're shouting into a void here. I think that debate is good, but we're we're shouting into a void. It's it's kind of like what you were trying to play devil's advocate with with Shannon last week, which is you know kind of uh, pissing into the wind here. Because it's clear that one side, there are, there are people like Paul who clearly, and he lives in New York City, uh, he clearly sees that there is a problem. But he's within a party that clearly does not have the political will, for whatever reason, to enforce policies right now. Policies already on the book, books right now. 
And so we're also we're also in an era where we can't we can't actually, you know, the, what was the James Langford, uh, Mitch McConnell legislation that was seen as the compromise. And it was, you know, a lot of it was really, really bad. Most of it, pretty much all of it was really, really bad. It's like, no, illegal immigration is fine as long as it's capped at 2000 people a day. That, that's mm-hmm. not really solving the problem. So, again, I'm, I'm back to where we're where we were at last week. I think it was on the Dace group. I just. On almost every single front nationally, on big issues that affect the sovereignty of this country, people like me, I I feel stuck. I think Paul probably feels stuck as well. And in my view, I don't think it's necessarily a guarantee that necessarily changing out the guard in the White House would solve the problem. The reason why we're in this place to begin with is that we didn't get the wall done. We didn't make fundamental and lasting changes to border patrol policy when the iron was hot. So we're at a position where people who actually want to do something and care about the Lake and Rileys of the world, we're in a position where we're just not represented in the places where it matters. You are clearly not alone in thinking you're stuck when one of the most accurate pollsters of the last several cycles with all of the topsy-turviness we've had puts out a poll with arguably the two most well-known presidential candidates in American history to ever run against each other. And their their result this week was 40 to 39. That, that tells you that few people willing to take a position on two so so defined people. What that tells you is that there's a lot of people that feel like they are stuck. And there needs to be some place, some place where they feel like, now listen, I'm not compromising my principles, man. I'm putting the fun and fundamentalism all the way till Jesus comes back or calls me home. You know, I love Paul to death. I'm not moderating my positions at all for him or anybody else, unless he can prove me wrong. Then I would, but good luck. Um, but there needs to be some place at least where those people that can feel like they're stuck, that are concerned about the future, at least feel like there's some place where we can have these conversations and be honest about it. And it's okay to ask questions and take positions and then let's test those things and iron sharpens iron. We'll see what happens. Let's get to the exit question with issue three. Let's just skip right to that, Aaron, if you don't mind. So, I mean, Trump has taken a lot of legal, that was going to be issue three was Trump finally got a legal win in this lawfare against him. He has taken a lot of L's um, in courts um, for the last year and a half. He got a big win with the Colorado State Supreme Court decision by the Supreme Court this week. Uh, They went nine to nothing against uh, what Colorado, the state of Colorado did, trying to use the 14th Amendment to uh, circumvent any due process and and disqualify Trump from the ballot. The Supreme Court said nine to nothing. Okay, what do you think the SCOTUS vote will be? On the Trump immunity case in a couple of months, they're going to hear arguments now. It was April 26th, the 22nd. It's officially April 25th. You're probably going to get a ruling on this in May, uh, no later than June 30 when the session ends. What do you think the SCOTUS vote will be on that immunity case, Paul? Either seven to two or eight to one against Trump. Uh, Unless Trump's defense strategy radically shifts, there is just no way the Supreme Court is ruling in his favor. It's, It's a ridiculous argument to make that a president could order the assassination of a political rival and not be criminally liable. I mean, to me, it's just an embarrassingly weak argument, and I can't imagine a scenario where they rule in his favor. Todd? Yeah, unless there's some sort of narrow ruling view of this that I'm not aware of, and I've got to think that if that was out there in the ether, Steve, you would have been all over it by now. I'll one up, Paul. I think this might be 9 nothing in that direction because unless you have some, again— nuanced narrow view of this i i agree with paul it's it's pretty absurd what if what if when they go to the supreme court they do take a nuanced position that says immunity should apply to political speech clearly this was political speech not intended for an action it's the embellishment of politics okay and it and 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 there should be immunity for political speech specifically that should be an absolute what if that was the nuanced approach they took with the court which is more nuanced than what they've done thus far to me, that's a totally different argument. That should go nine nothing in the other direction. It should. Is that the argument? But that that's not Trump's, the argument. Yeah, no, that's, that's not, not the, the argument, argument they've made Trump's, yet. Yeah. No, they, no, they've tried to make it because they're trying to encompass all of his other cases into this one immunity. That that's why they haven't done that. They've tried to say what essentially their position is. What Paul is claiming that is their position they've taken thus far. 
So, yeah, that's bad. So I think it's going to be either nine nothing or seven two. I think nine nothing with concurring opinions, kind of disagreeing with the entire process, maybe from Alito and Thomas. But it's going to be pretty pretty decided. If they do, if they do, if miraculously they do rule on a on a narrow kind of a narrow political speech ruling, mm-hmm. uh, I still think it could be five to four against Trump. Let's skip ahead to predictions. Todd, I'll let you go first. Oh, my prediction is that there are women's uh, on on women's sports. uh, There's going to be uh, speaking of finally people doing something. uh, There's going to be a ruling within the next year that definitively prevents men from playing in women's sports uh, a legal ruling against the ncaa okay aaron so i believe so again bookmark what paul said earlier because that's the mental math that i used to make this prediction i think donald trump is going to win in november because we're a nation under god's judgment And I think the affirmation of all of the worst instincts of that world, I'm not saying that everybody who supports Trump has bad instincts, is acting on bad faith, but I think the rewarding of the lack of accountability for COVID and other things, but mostly COVID, that is actually a sign of God's judgment. Paul, you're under, you're off the hook. Our show is much more in peril by what Aaron just said than anything you did because it came from somebody on our own side. That's not a joke, actually. It's funny, but it's actually true. So no one's going to remember, Paul, your rant at the top. Okay. Everybody, all my inbox now is going to be Aaron and, and Trump derangement syndrome. So you're you're off the hook there, Paul. Your prediction. Right. Thank you, Aaron. Preach my hey, inbox. I predicted that you. he's going to win. Why, why does any, yeah. anybody uh, get upset with me for that? Yeah, you know, because you know how this works. Yeah, but I appreciate it nevertheless. Paul, go ahead. The sleeper GOP pickup in the Senate this November will be Justin Amash in Michigan. He will have a challenging primary, but with such a crowded field, I do believe he will build a large enough coalition of the principled conservatives who support people like DeSantis, Chip Roy, Tom Massey, the libertarians who support Rand Paul, the forward party and no labels crowd who respect his bipartisan record and the uh, independents like myself who appreciate his willingness to buck the trend. And then in a general, I think he's built up enough goodwill with the Democrats who support his foreign policy positions, especially in Michigan with this Gaza conflict that he'll have the coalition to beat out an establishment Democrat like Alyssa Slotkin. And I think it would be great for the Senate to have him in there because he is exactly the type of principled legislator who could win over independents like myself and uh, who desperately want more transparency and character from people like him. All right. Paul, thank you very much. A quick prediction for me. I think RFK Jr. will go fully independent and not Libertarian Party. That's my quick prediction. I think he'll go fully independent. Thank you, Paul. You got it. All right, we'll come back. Hour two is next and Feedback Friday next. Back to you with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I am Steve Dace. He's Todd Erzin. He's Aaron McIntyre. And you are you and can let us know what you think about what we think. And I got to tell you, after that first half hour, a lot of you are telling me about what you think right now. I mean, the reaction has been insane. Um, uh, the email alerts I'm receiving right now in real time, uh, that is one of the most reaction producing segments we've ever had, uh, both ways. So, uh, fascinating. I may have to curate a bunch of these and then next week's feedback Friday might just be these responses on both sides. And just to get people's uh, reactions, it's fascinating. Uh, but you can let us know what you think about what we think by emailing us, Steve at Steve That's D E A C E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab follow me at Steve day show on Twitter, get our Instagram and TikTok. And if you listen via the podcast, if you wouldn't mind, please leave us a five-star review. And if you uh, have done that, we greatly appreciate the fact that uh, you have. Uh, And you can also 
uh, hit subscribe or in the case of iTunes, follow. And that way, every time you do a, uh, a you know, uh, you, we do a new show, it shows up in your feed every single time. And thank you to all of you that have done that for us as well. I want to also thank our friends at Magic Spoon. They have reinvented your favorite childhood cereals to taste great, but each serving contains zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four to five grams of net carbs per serving. It's wholesome. It's high protein, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free. It's a great way without being taste free to relive those moments eating your favorite cereals while watching your favorite cartoons. Plus, it's 140 calories a serving. They've got new flavors. They just launched two limited edition flavors, oatmeal cookie and honey graham. Um, And for a limited time, uh, they're available right now. So make sure you get them before they are sold out. Head over to magicspoon.com slash dace to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And don't forget to add to their limited edition honey graham and oatmeal cookie flavors. Be sure to use our promo code DACE at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon, so confident in their product, it's backed with 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of high-protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash DACE and use the code DACE to save $5 off. All right, let's go to some feedback Friday, and where do we begin? You guys ready to go? You bet. Always. All right, let's start here with Ken. Ken says, I keep an acronym list at work. I'm starting another list. Let me be clear equals everything I'm about to say is BS. I have been clear equals you have been given this load of BS before. Insurrectionist equals non-communist American. Threat to democracy equals investigating government corruption. Election denier equals auditor of voting process. Christian nationalist equals Christian. Science denier equals those that ask questions. I don't have a problem with any of those. I think I agree with every single one of them. What about you guys? Uh, Agree. You know, words need action for them to have meaning. That's um, the fact that we have to clarify any of it. I just got done talking about what a border is. Like... But there's nuance. We need more action. No, we don't need any of that. We, we just that we are we are on every level at a point in this culture. Like back in the day when mom said to the kids, you know, wait till your dad gets home. Mm-hmm. The reason what we shouldn't have to talk about any of this. But dad never comes home. That's the problem, and does what needs to be done. What a great analogy. Yeah, you're right. Dad never comes home. And along those, go ahead, Aaron, I want you to chime in first. Go ahead. I mean, that words, we were always going to end up in this place, okay? Ever since Roe and the proliferation of just at will baby killing, if we could not define what a human being is, we were never going to be able to define what a marriage is, what a border is, what a woman is, what a, just go on down the list. We were Mm -hmm. never going to, when we could not define the first and foundational reality of existence, what is being, we were never going to be able to exist, really, as a cohesive people, group of people, as a nation. Once we went down that road, there's, it's a one-way street. Um, I want to address right now because it's in the context of this conversation too i want to address right now one one note i have gotten a few times um several people are have sent note most of the notes have actually surprisingly even if they don't agree with the opinions expressed particularly by paul most of the responses have been surprisingly positive um but the few that are negative there there is an overall sentiment and I want to address it right now while it's fresh of, because what happened last hour, I think is, is for me, it's one of the most favorite hours we've ever done on the history of this show, in my opinion, because in many respects, it's, it's the, it's a rare fulfillment of why I started doing this show and why I do it the way that I do it. There are several of you sending me notes saying, I can't believe you're doing this. You're letting someone say these things. And in an election year, you know, r- we need rush back. He would never allow this. Um, well, in many respects, we do need rush back. 
but I'm, I'm, I'm Steve Dace and I have a different purpose to why I'm doing what I'm doing than Rush did. When, when, when Rush entered into the fray, there wasn't a broken social compact in America. There was a silent majority. It was August 31st, 1988. George H.W. Bush was about to win California. Yeah. If you're Aaron's generation or younger, the Republican presidential candidate was about to win California. And it would be the seventh time in the last 10 presidential elections that a Republican won California. I know that seems unfathomable today. California is one of the most demonically influenced places on planet Earth. In 1988, it thought Michael Dukakis was too liberal. I was a sophomore in high school, Todd. Were you a junior, probably, a year ahead of me? Yeah. Aaron is almost... Aaron, you're, what, five years from still being born? Yeah. A guy who owns his own home and is about to have a second kid. Wouldn't be born for another five years. The world was much different when Rush arrived. And that's why he arrived providentially in the time that he did. What was lacking to try and keep the social compact together, because frankly, without people like Rush, it would have broken sooner. The instincts and impulses that are happening in our culture right now of denying people access or agency based on their viewpoints, these didn't start just a few years ago. These instincts were there many, many years ago. At the, at, at the first ascent of Russia's popularity, Democrats tried to reimpose the fairness doctrine to silence him rather than debate him, rather than try to compete with him. The social compact in this country would have broken many years earlier than it did without people like Rush, particularly Rush, who spawned people like him. Why do I say that? Because what was lacking in the country was agency for one side of the debate. For every McLaughlin group that we tried to emulate in the last hour that let Pat Buchanan talk, and it was a half-hour show on PBS that nobody other than nerds watched, like me, and it was with five panelists, counting the host. So 23 minutes, not counting commercials. Pat Buchanan was talking what there, guys? Eight, nine, ten minutes an episode, tops? Tops. Outside of a few places like that, Crossfire, there was nowhere else where the other half of America was given a voice, was given a, was given a, a place that they felt like they could connect and engage the process and be a part of it and, and activate. And Rush provided that. And the industry that he spawned and inspired that came after him provided that. That is what was needed at that time. At that time, it was possible to have a silent majority. I know there are people, boomers in this audience, you're old enough to remember those times. As I turn 50, I start watching, I've been talking about it, I start watching sporting events from my childhood, and I'm like, what happened to this country? I cannot believe the commercials that are going on during NBA All-Star Games. They're like Republican get-out-the-vote commercials. So I'm, I'm feeling you in how things have changed and not for the better on many fronts. But we are not going to win the next generation by trying to do the exact same things we did before in previous generations. Every time that's tried, it fails. You have to understand the times like a son of Issachar, and therefore you know what to do about them. Jesus consistently throughout the Gospels, admonishes his followers for not understanding the signs of the times. Or as we like to say nowadays on the right, do you know what time it is? Here's what time it is. If we can't get, can I be very blunt, Todd and Aaron, you guys okay with that for a minute? Shoot. I mean, I mean really blunt. Really blunt? I'm going to be really blunt. If we can't get people like Paul Alexander on our side, there's going to be a civil war in America. Mark it down. It's unavoidable. I'll say it again. I want to make sure Media Matters quotes me correctly. 
If we can't get people like Paul Alexander on our side at some point, there will be a civil war in America. Paul is what is left of the reasonable, squishy, whatever you want to call it, cartilage between these two frictions. He's all that's left, people like him. And there's not much of him. A willingness to at least listen. A willingness to let Todd yell at him back because we let him yell at Trump. And then again, after listening to everything, he's the guy that says at the end, I don't know, maybe maybe it is time for mass deportations. He represents what's left. I, I don't do things on this show randomly. It may seem like that. Our, the, the, our takes are random. They're not scripted. They're not contrived. They're not rehearsed. But everything is structured with a purpose. Paul is here for a purpose, not just because I like him, and I genuinely do. But I like all kinds of other people that I wouldn't allow here. Todd is here for a purpose. Aaron is. Why, what's Todd's purpose? Dual. One, I need another man my age who, to my face, off the air, will say, you're wrong. That's BS. And he does that when it calls for it. The other reason he's here is I'm not Catholic. And they've been the determinative voting block in the, in the country for the last 50 years. One of them. Catholics and suburbans, which are basically a lot of the same voters. So he's here to represent a very important and a very important block of people. Who's Aaron? Why is he here? Two reasons. He's very capable at his job. Secondly, he's a millennial. He's the next generation we have to reach. I, I'm an evangelical Gen Xer. I don't need help reaching evangelicals. That's my tribe. I know the tongue. I'm not Catholic. I'm not a millennial. I don't know. I, until recently, I didn't know what a Nicki Minaj was, and now that I know, I'd like to keep it that way. But I need to know some of these things. That's why they're here. That's why Paul is here. As a conduit to a group of people we have to reach. And if we don't, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I may be wrong, but this is my read of the times. We are not, therefore, in a time where I believe I have the time to pet you, to rub your belly, and say, we'll make, we'll make it all stop on November 5th. I wish it were that simple. I wish, I wish Paul could have, would have said things that were factually untrue, that I could have interrupted and stopped him. But he didn't. He, say, he gave opinions on facts that I don't agree with necessarily. But the facts of what he laid out in his rant are not untrue. So if we want to win, he's the voter. The, the, he's one of the voters we have to get. I can promise you one way to never get somebody on your side is to never hear what they have to say. We're in an era we have to evangelize on multiple fronts. Again, this is my read. I could be wrong. And if I am, it'll cost me my career. And that's okay. But this is my read and why I do what I do. And why I'm not just going to try to emulate Rush. It's, it's why when my publisher came to me and said, after Rush passed. And the reason I'm bringing up Rush is because a lot of you are in my inbox. I loved Rush. He's one of the reasons I am what I am, and I, I'm where I am. I, I view his brother as a dear friend who's endorsed my books. I just communicated with him yesterday. My wife, read, my wife read two things when she decided she wanted to get to know me better. The Way Things Ought to Be and See I Told You So. The two best-selling nonfiction books Rush, Rush wrote. That's what she read to get to know me. When my publisher came to me and said, what do you think about trying to pick up where Rush left off with these Rush Revere books? I said, I'm not even going to try to walk a centimeter in those moccasins. But if you let me do my own thing with some of the things I learned from people like Rush, 
I'm in. And that's why we're doing America's Christian heritage instead. Why? Because 40 years ago, I wouldn't have had to do America's Christian heritage. 40 years ago, you still watched the Peanuts special on national TV that basically laid out my entire book, Why Thanksgiving, in a cartoon that everyone watched every Thanksgiving. That's what, and that was the world Rush came into in 1988. That is not the world in 2024. I wish it were. I've sent two kids off into the world. I'm about to send now a grown man off into the world. I'm about to welcome a grandbaby into the world. I wish it was, I wish we had today's technology with 1988 culture. I wish these things, we don't. Now, like Todd, I agree. The answers are in to the future or in the past. We have to go back. I agree. But we're not going to get there the same way. The path is different. We have to evangelize now. We don't have the standing army to say, you know, we'll just see out in the valley. We got our best. You bring your best. Mano y mano. We'll get destroyed. They own all the institutions. We have to evangelize now. And that means you're going to have to put up with a level of dissent we didn't have to in previous years. We're going to have to tolerate a level of skepticism and scrutiny we didn't have to in previous years. You know why? Because the first thing people typically want to know before they join your movement is if it's real and authentic. If it's not, they've got other places to go. There's plenty of other scams and games out there. People are running on them. But if they don't think it's real, if they don't think it's authentic... They won't join. As I said last hour, you saw two great frustrations between Todd and Aaron. I'm sorry, between Todd and, and, and Paul. And they're personal. Paul's personal frustration that he feels as if he's not truly being invited to leave a plantation he'd like to leave. But he feels as if he's being asked to just join another crazy train. He may be wrong. I think, in, and I think in essence he is, even though there's elements of what he said that I agree with. Then win the argument. Stop sending me emails. Be like this guy who doesn't allow this. Be like that guy who doesn't allow. This. I'm not that guy. I'm this guy. And this guy got into this because here's what we need. This is a football. This is a Bible. This is a constitution. We have to go back. I know this is the dirt road. No one knows this more than me. I lived paycheck to paycheck until four years ago. You'll notice you don't see me booked on a bunch of shows anymore. This is the first book I put out in several years. I've done no interviews on. None. Think it's a coincidence that that happened after I endorsed DeSantis? Of course it isn't. I'd go back knowing what I know now, how it turned out. I'd do it all again. Why? He was the superior candidate. Superior resume, integrity, worldview, reputation. Gave me the better chance to get Paul to join us. And people like him. I can't take the money I make from 10,000 more book sales with me to eternity anyway. I'd like to, take, I'd like to take Paul with me to eternity, though. I'd like to take him. I have the option of taking Paul with me. I don't have the option of taking another 10,000 book sales with me. That I can't take with me. Paul, maybe I can take with me. And Paul is my mission, not the 10,000 more book sales. And people like him. And frankly, that is our mission. So what did we do? We gave him a chance to be heard. And then later, when we frankly found what he had to say insufficient, it was his turn to give Todd a chance to be heard. It's not 1988. It's 2024. 
1988, if any elected official had stood up and said, we need to castrate children, regardless of their party affiliation, they would have been arrested and put on trial. And everyone would have agreed with it. It is now a campaign platform. And you're often put on, you're threatened to be put on trial for disagreeing with it. I know it hurts to see these things happen in your time. But we're almost out of time to give any time left to the next generation. And if there's anything the pending arrival of my grandchild has done with me is steeled my resolve to stay on this path. I may have to look Autumn in the eye one day and maybe relatively soon and fulfill Reagan's warning of many years ago of explaining to our grandchildren what it was like in America when we were once free. But should that day occur, I'm going to make damn sure I fired every bullet I had to avoid it happening. If I thought the way to avoid it happening was just to blindly give Republicans more majorities in Congress to screw us. I do it. I know a lot of you want that. And a lot of the people that promote that message are more successful than me and have bigger audiences than me. Maybe they'll turn out to be right. Here's what you, here's what may surprise you. I actually hope that they are. You know why? Cause that's a lot easier path, man, than the one I'm trying to blaze. This is the dirt road. This is, you know, I'm not a first round pick in the NFL with a guaranteed deal and I'm starting as a rookie. This is, I'm playing single A, double A baseball, riding a bus between Durham and Muskogee. Okay. This is the harder path. It would be so much easier, so much, so much more profitable to do what some of you in my inbox want me to do. But here's the thing. I don't think it'll be profitable. You get the reference there. I think the word, that word will return void. I think that time is over. I could be wrong. I kind of want to be. And if I am, I'll be done here. And you saved America again. Congrats. I, I, just, I, I just think it's too far gone for that. And I didn't get into this business to lose and to deceive people. We have to win new people. We have to. That is a messier process than let's all let, let all the like-minded get, get around and, and figure out how we're going to conquer the world. That can be a messy process too. Believe me, I've been in plenty of those meetings. This is a much harder process. One thing you learn losing over 100 pounds, it's a hell of a lot harder taking the weight off than it ever was putting it on. And it's a hell of a lot less fun taking the weight off than it ever was putting it on. Can I get an amen on that? But why do you do it then? You do it for the long-term health of your body. Why do we do it this way? For the long-term health of the body. I could do it better. By all means, Give me your suggestions. I read everything you guys send me. I can't respond. There's so many. But I still, to this day, read everything you send me. Or have my wife read it if I don't have time, and she's an extension of me. If there's better ways to do this, I'm open, man. I'm open. But at, at some point, there's going to have to be some friction. The enemy's not going to let go of, 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 what, of its power. Because we passively watched Fox News, petted each other about how great Republicans are and how bad Democrats are, and voted accordingly in November. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit more of a fight than that. And I know you're not accustomed to hearing this path. I know that. I've been dealing with that my entire career. And I don't 
really know, you know, I'm, I don't, there's plenty of people in this business. Some I work with here that have inspired me and been helpful to me, but I don't know of anybody else trying to do at the heart what we're trying to do with the biblical worldview as the prime directive. And so I'm, we're kind of making this up as we go along. All right. You know, and so that means we're going to make, we're going to, we're going to step on rakes and potholes and, you know, and, and fall down flat on our faces. And by all means, when that happens, hold us accountable for that. But I'm not Rush. I'm not as good as him. I'm not as talented as him. And even if I were, I would not want to repeat what he did because it's not his time. The Lord called him home. His work was done. We're here because this is our time. It is our time now to fight the good fight, to keep the faith, and then finish the race. It's our time. I've got about a minute and a half or two minutes here left. Gentlemen, if you want to react to any of that at all. Well, that right there is why I'm with that guy till the end of the line. No questions asked. It, it's absolutely worth it. Way more worth, worth it, worth it uh, than uh, you having this take on uh, somebody or your, the letter writer having this take or on Trump the day after Trump says that not only is the jab fantastic at curing uh, COVID, but also cancer. Listen, uh, Benny Hinn going on stage and hitting people with his jacket has more scientific credibility than that. So I'm with Steve. Yeah, this. <clears throat> For those of you who are still with us. Thank you. <laughs> because <laughs> the motto of this show, basically, on any given day, you could wake up, turn on the Steve Day show, listen to the podcast as you're coming home from work, and the motto is basically, F you and thanks for listening. That We're not perfect at all. Far from it. Any truth that we expose any truth that we proclaim on this show that does not get exposed or proclaimed elsewhere in this sphere is not because of us it's in spite of us i want to make that very clear and so any given day we could justly or unjustly trample on your idols justly or uh, justly trampling on idols is the only trampling on idols we may, may um, offend you, I guess, in ways that is not perfect because we're not perfect. But for those who are earnestly trying to find the truth and seek the truth and you're still with us, we appreciate you. That's all. Amen. I have to say last night I was very encouraged by the group of people I got to be around here in Minneapolis and speak to and talk to. Um, and they know. I mean... I mean, this is the only state in the union, Walter Mondale one. They're, they're watching the spirit of the age try to California their state right now. So why they bring me in? Because they know. They know this is going to take a different level of confrontation and activism than what it's taken in previous eras. For a decade now, Patriot Mobile has been America's only American wireless service provider. They have, again, just like we talked about uh, with another one of our partners uh, last hour, it's it's not that they have our value system. That's that's not why we support them on the show. I, I believe in meritocracy. So um, it's that it's a great product. I use it myself. I've used their customer service myself. Um, they've just been a, ph a phenomenal addition to our family. And they've been um, over the top gracious. And they start thinking, okay, you're just doing that because, you know, I, I, we promote you on the show. And I've heard from so many of you that have similar stories. It's, it's that they share our values that makes it a bonus. And frankly, those two things go hand in hand, right? One of our values, love your neighbors, you love yourself. That's the very essence of customer service. And they do that. And they do that uh, exemplary at, at Patriot Mobile. Make the switch today. Uh, don't directly fund people who hate you. 
especially when a product that's just as good or better exists, and it does in this case with Patriot Mobile. Their team will help you find the best plan for your family's needs. Keep your phone, upgrade your phone, keep your number, change your number, whatever you want to do. They'll make it happen for you. If you're a veteran or first responder, they've got extra ways to say thank you for your service if you want to let them know when you go to make the switch. Everybody can get a free activation with the offer code Steve when you go to patriotmobile.com slash Steve. That's patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Again, patriotmobile.com slash Steve. I want to go back to some feedback Friday and this note from Crystal Trevino. I know you get a ton of these, but I still feel like you needed to hear my story. My mom was 57 years old when she contracted COVID on November 12th, 2021. We know the date because she and and three others sat at the same table at an event that evening and they all tested positive a few days later. We remember the date because it was the day my, my nephew, my mom's first grandson, was born and she never got the chance to meet him. My mom never took the jab. She had no known comorbidities. She ran 5Ks even at 57. By the way, she sent along a picture of her mom, beautiful woman, clearly healthy. When she got sick, she monitored her symptoms from home as long as she could. When her oxygen dipped into the low 80s and she could barely breathe, her husband called an ambulance. My mom was admitted to the hospital on the evening of November 30th, 2021. The next two months were full of highs and lows like you wouldn't believe. My family held daily prayer meetings over Zoom with friends and strangers all over the globe. We prayed harder than we ever have, and we expected a miracle. Unfortunately, God had other plans. My mom held out on taking remdethasnir, that's what I call it, as long as she could, but she was scared, and the doctors convinced her she would die without it. When she was at a low point alone in the ICU, a doctor also convinced her to sign a DNR. We prayed God would keep her alive that night until we could have her remove it the following day. He graciously did. The day-to-day events over the weeks that followed are all a blur to me now. She would struggle, and then there would be signs of improvement. There was talk of an ECMO and eventual lung transplant. There There was lots of praying and hope, then waiting. Lots and lots of waiting. They eventually put in a tracheotomy to help her breathe. Then, when the hospital staff said there was nothing more they could do for her, they convinced us to have her transferred to a nursing facility to, quote, help her recover. They sedated and intubated her prior to the transfer uh, transfer by ambulance, and she never woke up after that. She spent the next couple of weeks or so at the facility while her kidneys and lungs continued to fail. God called my mama home on January 20th, January 28th, 2022, just six days after her 58th birthday. I held her hand, five months pregnant with her second grandson, as she took her last breath and her soul left her body. To say I've been angry is an understatement. I've been angry with God. It's okay. I know he can take it. And I've been angry with our government, the doctors, and everyone involved in this nightmare. My mom is a statistic now. They'll say she died because she didn't take the jab. At this point, I'm just too tired and too angry to argue. I know the truth. Like you, I'm not ready to just move on from any of this. I want retribution for my mom and for her now four grandbabies who will have to grow up without her. I know God has a plan and I will never understand it. I also know God says vengeance is his and my hope remains in that promise. Keep fighting the good fight, Steve, and may God continue to get the glory. That is from Crystal Trevino. I think that speaks for itself. And... I have read hundreds of letters like that. But we have to move on. No one has to apologize. No one has to repent. Everyone can brag about how they saved so many people, all the great things that were done.
I wish it was 1988. I wish the, I wish the political arguments we were having, like when Rush came in, were how many criminals are we going to give the death penalty to? That's the stuff we were arguing about in 1988. It's 2024. What's a criminal? <laughs> Folks, we have a crisis in American education and as a result, a national crisis. For decades, young people haven't been properly taught about our American heritage or what my friends at Hillsdale call civic education. The result, too many young Americans are rejecting the principles of liberty. Americans between 18 and 30 years old are those most likely to reject our founding principles. Look at the founding fathers as villains. Stand for the removal of historical statues, even up to George Washington. 15 years ago, the Teddy Roosevelt statue outside the Museum of Natural History in New York City was a beloved movie character played by Robin Williams. Fifteen years later, they removed that statue of Teddy Roosevelt in front of the Museum of Natural History. But yeah, let's just go back and do what we did in 1988. Hillsdale's understanding that we can't do that. We have to go back, but that's by moving forward in the era in which we're in. So they've constructed these 60-second uh, Constitution minutes. They're short, because that's where our attention spans are nowadays. They're clear, concise principles of liberty, because your children weren't taught them. And if you want to help your children and the next generation learn these principles, uh, you can listen to them for yourself, and then hopefully, after doing so, you're going to like them enough, you're going to share them with the people you know. Uh, just go to daysforhillsdale.com to hear them out. daysforhillsdale.com. Uh, and while you're there, uh, get, reserve a free pocket copy of the Constitution, courtesy of Hillsdale College, at daceforhillsdale.com. I'm trying to think of where to go next. I am a new listener. When you guys talk about normies and their obsession with comforts, as you all sit in an air-conditioned office using technology designed by normies, we'll drive home in air-conditioned vehicles all designed and built to, by normies to air-conditioned homes built by normies seems like banal hypocrisy. I heard one of you state that everything is the whisper of the devil if not put through the prism of God. I am not sure what the prism of God is as I could not find it in Scripture. Another statement about having a headache, so take a pill, displays an arrogant assumption that you know better than the afflicted person how to handle their malady. I certainly believe that anything that becomes more important than God is idolatrous. However, if a preacher takes ibuprofen so that his headache stops distracting him from preparing his sermon notes, is that a satanic whisper? I was diagnosed with leukemia two years ago and I'm taking chemotherapy drugs to hopefully eliminate the cancer. Am I simply obsessed with comfort and ease because I chose to use medication to be cured? I, when did I become, um, yeah. who's the Christian scientist chick that started that cult? Marion something or other was, uh, what's her nuts' name? I don't know what this is about. Um, you I find your cat. You threw a rock into a pack of dogs and one of them's yelping. That's what's going on. I find your categorization of people who are not out aggressively addr addressing issues that face our society non-biblical. Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 12 clearly states that there are many parts to the body and many jobs for believers. Indeed, um, one of those parts was that you were permitted to not confront evil. I added that editorial comment, but that's clearly what he's implying. Um, while he was speaking about spiritual gifts, it, this applies to today's situation as well. Perhaps belie you believe, since you have a public forum, you are doing your part in this battle, and I agree with that. However, I would ask you to remember with humility that there are many normies who are praying for you and others like you and supporting you and telling others about you. When you categorize normies, please recognize that this is a diverse group with many parts, and your blanket assertion of them being only concerned with comfort is inaccurate. Thanks for listening. I plan on continuing to listen to your podcast. Is that I, is, is, as I believe that non-foundational disagreements among people of faith is normal and does not constitute a reason for severing relationships from CJ. 
I'm not, I don't really even know how to respond to that. I, it, it's, it's the most curious note I have received this year, which is why I shared it. I'm not, the, I, the guy went on, to, I, I don't understand CJ's complaint about normies when almost any, nothing he said is how we describe normies. We're, we're actually talking about people who are not doing the things that CJ says people like him are doing that are not getting in the fight, not supporting people who are. He's not even saying he's are, doing you know, anything. Living comfortably numb. I don't understand his note. Go ahead, Todd. He's, he's winking and not, he's, he's, te- he's, he, he's telling you I, I'm, I'm doing nothing and I resent you even bringing it up. I mean, we, there, there's no list there. Hey, and I see you and raise you. You got no scoreboard. I mean, my mom died of leukemia. All right. What kind of trail of tears nonsense was that? If I get started on this, I'm going to make it like a hand-holding session with Paul Alexander when I get done with you. We have no time for this. Are you kidding well, blame me? It on, blame it on me. I shouldn't have put it on the air. It's my fault. I I chose to put it on the air because I didn't understand where he was coming from. I... I, I I agreed with this premise and I didn't understand his app, but I didn't understand why we disagreed on his application. I didn't, I truly didn't get it. That's why I shared it. The technology in the video switcher yeah. behind me is something that would have been inconceivable 40, 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. A normie came up with that. A guy sitting on his couch watching college football. Yeah, I know. He came up with that technology. That's what you're claiming. Uh, A guy addicted to comfort came up with the idea for sucking the moisture out of the air and cooling it. Cooling the air. No, extraordinary people came up with the technology. Mm-hmm. Teams of them, extraordinary See, people. Aaron, you're articulating why I didn't understand his complaint. I don't get it. Yeah. I, by the way, the air conditioning is not even working today. He's. Does, do, by the not, way, most of last summer, we did the show in one of the hottest summers in recent memory in Iowa. Most of last summer, we our air conditioning was broken. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I, I don't. We, we had to have fans going all of last summer. So I don't. I don't. I, I didn't get his note. That's why I wanted to read. It. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm missing something here. Okay. He wants to tell us he's really praying for us, yet he resents the fact. And I was the one who said it. Everything, everything needs to go through the prism of God. And then he says that's not biblical. What the hell are you talking about? That's not biblical. He's soft in certain places, and he wants to say soft. And we all know that's what's going on over there. What's his name? That's it. The, you, which parts? Tell me then. You notice he didn't mention them. Which parts of any of our lives do we get to put over here on the shelf that has nothing to do with God? Anybody? I think that's actually the very definition of sin when we do that. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Did he say what his wife's name was? Deborah. Deborah. <laughs> What did you do, Deborah? When Deborah's really worked over his, or her husband. Sorry, Freudian slip there. Yes, yeah. If, if that's the case, I totally get it. At some point, when the wife, at some point, even if the wife's wrong, you got to defend her honor. I get it. All right, all right, gentlemen. Closing thoughts here in the final two minutes, and then we'll stick around and do overtime. Uh, and in so many ways. The response to Paul Alexander, utterly legitimate complaint against Trump. Then in Paul turning around and not either being capable or will. And again, I do like Paul to show the same level of vigor on what's going on the border when there's such an obvious and People cost. should know, by the way, when we got done at the end of the show, yeah. you and Todd, man, shook hands, yes. you know, metaphorically. And hey, he's so fun to be around when he came yeah. over Christmas two years ago or whatever it was, and we had went out for steak. It was a blast. He's, he's so much fun. But, like, all that vigor, that's, see, here's my point. I, it, had Paul not made that rant on Trump, which he came in guns blazing, ready to go and doing it, had he not done it and then said all the same things about the border, you know what? I, 
I still would have been pissed. I probably would have brought up certain, but I, you don't you don't get to do that. Not not because he's like took umbrage with like the rules of the show, but you're passionate about that, but you can't find it here. No, no. We we, we got to be all in. Everybody in the pool. Now, be either hot or cold, not lukewarm. All right. That that's what really got me nuts because steve is absolutely right and i've been around these people we we have no time either you are a genuine citizen of this country genuinely capable of seeing the child of god in front of you or you're just a slurpee of some derivation that steve's absolutely right it's a guaranteed loser and it may be a guaranteed loser that turns into civil war so I got more to say, but it's it's Hulk mad stuff, so we'll leave it there. We need Jesus. Not that he gets us Jesus. We need mm-hmm. the biblical Jesus really bad. Mm-hmm. Really bad. We, we need did. Jesus the man, not the Che Guevara Jesus. We need Jesus, uh, God made flesh, not the he gets us Hippy dippy buddy teddy bear Jesus. I should have washed Paul's feet. I'm sorry I didn't do that. That's what I should have done. <laughs>